Class B regulations allow us to safely fly small propeller-driven aircraft during the night and during bad weather. But what sort of restrictions and rules surround Class B aircraft? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to Class 12 in the Performance Series. Today we're going to be taking a look at Class B regulations. These are basically a list of rules and performance targets that we need to achieve in order to fly a Class B aircraft during bad weather and at night time. So it vastly opens up what we can do with our small propeller driven aircraft. If you haven't done so, I'd recommend going back and watching all the videos up until this point, as well as maybe trying the study session I did in the previous class to get a good understanding of the fundamentals because you will need those fundamentals to understand really what's going on with all these rules and regulations. So let's remind ourselves of what a Class B aircraft is, first of all. A Class B aircraft is small, less than 5,700 kilograms maximum takeoff mass. And it's also an aircraft with nine or fewer passenger seats. It has to be propeller driven, and that propeller can be stuck on the front of a piston engine or a jet engine to make a small turboprop. A Class B aircraft can be single engine or multi-engine, Although with a single engine Class B aircraft, their use is restricted legally and a single engine Class B aircraft cannot be used for public transport operations at night or in IMC, Instrument Meteorological Conditions, which essentially means bad weather. This basically severely limits the scope of what a single engine Class B aircraft can do. If a multi-engine propeller aircraft can't meet the Class B performance regulations that we're going to look at in this class, then it would default to be treated like a single engine aircraft and you would only be able to use it during the day and during good weather. The Class B performance regulations basically set conditions that operators of the aircraft, airlines really, have to follow in order to safely and legally fly these aircraft. It's like a list of requirements that we would have to satisfy in order to be able to fly in and out of that aircraft, uh, that airport in that aircraft on that day. The first thing we do is we need to take off and the regulations define some things that we need to achieve. The first of these is that we must take off below the maximum structural takeoff mass of the aircraft, which seems pretty obvious to me. The main thing we need to consider with takeoff is really the runway characteristics. Remember the takeoff distance available, accelerate stop distance available, and takeoff run available, including the runway, stop way, clear way, that kind of thing. So basically, if we have no stop way or clear way, the takeoff distance that we require multiplied by 1.25 must be less than the takeoff run available. So imagine there's nothing there. We have to take off in uh, our takeoff distance times 1.25 must be less than this total distance here. If we have a stop weight or a clear weight, then we need to make the, take the most restrictive of these three values. So the takeoff distance required must be less than the takeoff run available. That's this portion here, the actual ground of the runway. The takeoff distance required times 1.15 must be less than or equal to the takeoff distance available, so including the clear weight. And the takeoff distance required multiplied by 1.3 must be less than or equal to the accelerated stop distance available, so the runway and the stop way. So we take the most restrictive of that and we also apply some other factors to it depending on the runway surface. So if we're on a normal paved runway, it is fine, uh, even if it is wet. But for a grass runway, we multiply the distance by 1.2, that would be our takeoff distance required times by 1.2 and then we would apply these next factors. And if it's wet grass, it's 1.3. Once we've accounted for the surface, we need to think about the slope of the runway. And for every 1% of upslope, we must increase the takeoff distance required by 5% up to a maximum upslope of 2%. For downslope, we don't calculate the advantage that it would give us so that we don't overuse the downslope in our takeoff distance required calculations. This is similar to what we do with wind. If you remember, we only consider 50% of the headwind component uh, so that we aren't being helped too much by it and we take 150% of the tailwind so we are overcompensating for it. This is something you're going to see a lot in these regulations and the Class A regulations. We consider the things that would be negative for our performance 
so we can correct for them, but we don't necessarily consider the things that would be beneficial for our performance so that we're always on the safer side of things, we're more conservative than we need to be. So the process for finding out if we comply with our Class B regulations for takeoff would be we would calculate our takeoff distance required using our graphs or like a calculator app is what we actually use in the airlines. We apply the slope and the surface factors. Then we multiply by 1.3 and make sure it's less than the accelerate stop distance available. We also multiply that value by 1.15, make sure it's less than the takeoff distance available. And we also check it against takeoff run available. And we use the most restrictive value basically. What you can also do is you can divide the takeoff distance available by 1.15 and our takeoff distance required would not be allowed to exceed that value and you would divide the accelerate stop distance by 1.3 and our takeoff distance required would not be allowed to exceed that value. That's what you actually do when you're using the graphs in the exams. So after takeoff we have the initial climb phase where we have some assumptions made about how we are climbing with both engines operating. So we basically have takeoff power set on both engines. We're achieving at least a 4% climb gradient. The flaps are in the takeoff position. Our speed is 1.2 VS1 or 1.1 VMC, whichever is the higher of the two. And then the landing gear is retracted, if it can be, within seven seconds. If one of our engines fails on takeoff at 400 feet above the surface, the twin engine aircraft must be able to achieve a measurable positive gradient of climb up to 1500 feet. This assumes the critical engine has failed with the remaining engine still at takeoff power. We've got our positive climb gradient, at least anything positive. The flaps remain in the takeoff position. We have the same speed as we did at passing screen height, so it would still be 1.2 VS1 or 1.1 VMC. And the landing gear is now retracted. We continue this climb up to 1500 feet where we can reduce the climb gradient to 0.75%. This assumes that the critical engine remains failed, but the continuous engine has been reduced to maximum continuous thrust. This is basically, a, instead of maxing out the engine, we reduce the power a little bit, so the engine wear is less and it can last for longer. We've got a 0.75% climb gradient. The flaps at this point will now be retracted, reducing our drag, which means that instead of being measurably measurably positive, it now has to go up to 0.75, got a bit less drag. The speed increases a bit, so it's 1.2 VS1, and the landing gear is retracted. So this is the single engine and all engine requirements to fly a Class B aircraft at an airport. If we couldn't achieve these profiles, then we would not be able to operate as a Class B aircraft, meaning no IMC, no bad weather, and no night flights. And this is the case for an initial climb near somewhere where it's relatively flat. It's our base level. If there are mountains, then we need to consider obstacle clearance. And that means we may need to be able to achieve even better climb gradients than this. So if we want to fly a multi-engine aircraft in bad weather or at night using the Class B regulations, we need to clear all obstacles that are in the way by a vertical margin of 50 feet. Obstacles are considered in the way or if they are within a zone called the departure sector. The departure sector extends out from the end of the clearway or the end of the runway if there is no clearway in a sort of a fan shape. The exact dimensions look like this. We've got 60 meters plus half the wingspan for a straight period and then the extending out period would be 0.125 times the distance from the zero point, the zero point being the end of the clearway or the end of the runway. And we generally refer to these things in terms of their semi-width or their half-width. And the equation for that would be 60 meters plus the wingspan over two, the half wingspan, plus 0.15d. And we continue this out until we reach a maximum half-width of 300 meters if we have nav aids available or have visual references to departure and 600 meters either side if we have no aids. Say we have an obstacle in the sector that we cannot clear by 50 feet with our current weight. This means that we would have to reduce our takeoff mass so we achieve a better climb angle and can now clear it. Another way around this would be if the airport has a specific departure we can follow where the departure route immediately turns. We have to be above 15 feet and the bank angle has to be less than 15 degrees so it can't be like a full 
uh, brutal turn, it has to be just a sort of slight turn. Um, and this would then remove the departure sector so that the obstacle we couldn't clear now falls outside it. Imagine this fan, instead of looking this way, rotates a little bit and the obstacle that was here is now outside of that uh, uh, departure sector. If we use this method, the turn for departure, then we have to widen the departure sector out to a maximum of 600 meters and then 900 meters if we don't have any nav aids available. So it does help a little bit, but we do have to consider a wider area because we are turning. So if we do have obstacles in that departure sector, we need to climb safely and clear all obstacles within that sector by 50 feet. Now we need to figure out a minimum angle or a minimum gradient that we would need to achieve in order to do this safely. And that is what we were doing with the development of a net takeoff flight path. In this example here, we have this obstacle, this mountain on its own, that we would need to clear by 50 feet. We then take a line from 50 feet above that obstacle to the end of our takeoff distance required, our screen height, and we have our minimum climb gradient that we would need to achieve if we have the two engines or if an engine fails. We continue this line all the way up to 1500 feet uh, above the ground, but the way it looks could change depending on the cloud base. But before we talk about that though, we need to talk about our initial climb gradient. So this line connecting the two 50 feet above points is constructed at a 0 0.77, the all climb, all engine climb gradient, sorry, which takes a while to get your head around. Uh, and I find it quite difficult. So take your time, look up other information if you need to. But basically what it means is if we had all engines running with a certain takeoff mass and we're able to achieve a climb gradient of maybe, uh, let's call this 10% for nice maths, then 0 0.77 would be 7.7% climb gradient. And that line of 7.7% climb gradient would have to clear all obstacles by 50 feet as we go up. If we change our weight and increase the mass, which remember would make our climb angle shallower, then we're only going to achieve a climb gradient, for example, of 5%. Then if we take 0.77 of that gradient, we get a gradient of about 3.8%. And if we draw a line of 3.8%, we might not be able to clear the obstacles by 50 feet, or we might indeed hit the obstacles, which would mean we're too heavy. So we would have to reduce the weight back down, increasing our angle again, so that our all engine angle, so that when we take 77% of that angle, we achieve this line at least, and we can climb clearing all obstacles by 50 feet. Hopefully you follow that so far. So if we're too heavy, we might need to reduce our weight back down in order to achieve a 100% climb gradient that is steep enough so that the 77% climb gradient clears all the obstacles by 50 feet. So that 0 0.77 uh, times all engine climb gradient line will continue up to 1500 feet above the ground if we have a cloud base that is above 1500 feet. If the cloud base is below 1500 feet, like here for example, then an allowance is made for an engine failure occurring when we enter the clouds. So with a single engine we have reduced climb performance and we can also no longer see the obstacles ahead of us. We still climb up to the bottom of the cloud at this 0.77% all, sorry, 0 0.77 times the all engine climb gradient line. But on reaching the cloud base, we make the line less steep and is based off of the gross single engine climb gradient for that aircraft. Again, if this line was to come closer than 50 feet within an obstacle, uh, within the departure sector, then we would need to reduce our weight so that our single engine climb gradient would be sufficient again and also so that our initial two engine climb gradient could be steep enough maybe we enter the clouds a bit earlier here and that shallow line is sufficient to clear the obstacles by 50 feet a little while to get your head around read some textbooks answer some questions take it nice and slow just think about it 100 percent is nice and steep 77 percent still needs to be able to clear everything by 50 feet and your weight has to change to allow that to happen. 
Most of the regulations for Class B aircraft revolve around the takeoff and the landing. So during the cruise phase, there aren't that many, and I think they're all quite logical and reasonable. So the first one is the operator must ensure that the whole flight can take place above any relative safety altitudes along the length of the flight, uh, all the way down to a point a thousand feet above the destination aerodrome, taking into account any weather en route. Basically, you must be able to keep above all safety altitudes that might be en route. The second one, the aircraft must not climb to an altitude above the altitude where the maximum rate of climb of the aircraft is 300 feet per minute. We don't want to get near to the point of simultaneous high and low speed stall or coffin corner. If you have a quick look on Google, you'll understand what I'm talking about, or I do have a video in the Principles of Flight talking about coffin corner. The next one is if an engine fails, the descent or climb gradients with one engine shall be the normal all engine gradients with a 0.5% extra safety margin for the gradient, not the angle. Basically what it's saying is that if we have an engine failure and need to descend, our new descend angle would be a bit steeper because we don't have the thrust available to control our rate or our angle of descent as much. So we have to assume we're going to be descending faster and steeper so we don't make any plans that we can't achieve. We can't get out of a mountainous region or something like that. Basically, fly above safe altitudes, not too high that you can't that you reach coffin corner. And in case of an engine failure, make sure you can still clear all the obstacles if you need to in the descent. Landing has a few regulations, but nothing too complicated. The first and most straightforward one is that we must land with a weight that is below the maximum structural landing mass so we don't break the plane. Then we have to land within 70% of the planned runway available, taking into account which runways are open, which one's most likely to be used, for example. So you can either take the total landing distance available and uh, multiply it by 0 0.7 to get 70% and compare that with your calculated landing distance, or you can calculate your landing distance, multiply it by 1.43, and that's the new distance, which must not be more than the landing distance available. Uh, this landing distance has to be calculated with some certain assumptions as well. The aircraft must cross the threshold at 50 feet or as low as 35 feet, if approved by the regulator, in order to allow for a shorter landing distance in uh, tight, aircraft, uh, tight airports, basically where the runway is short. Uh, the altitude of the landing runway must be considered. Basically, it means you've got to account for density changes. That's what we looked at in the class on landing, density changes all these distances. And the surface and condition and slope characteristics of the runway must be considered as well. So I talked about these in the landing video. We basically have grass runways, we multiply the distance by 1.15, and any wet runways we multiply by 1.15 as well. And take note that these are different from the considerations on takeoff. And if, for example, we had a wet grass runway, we would multiply by 1.15 for the grass, and then again for the wet runway. We also have to consider the slope, just like we did for takeoff. But remember that downslope is bad for landing because we're going to get pulled down the slope. It's going to increase the landing distance. So it's 5% increase per 1% of downslope on landing, not upslope like it is on takeoff. And also we do the same thing that we do with wind all the time. Headwind only 50% and tailwind 150% must be used in the calculation to yeah, account for it and not rely on it too much in the case of tailwind. If for some reason we have to go around, whether through meteorological conditions, pilot error, controller error, basically there's loads of reasons to go around, then we need to ensure we climb steep enough to clear any obstacles, just as we did for the initial climb. Um, and basically, if we have both engines operating, we need to achieve a go around gradient of at least 2.5% with the landing gear extended, the flap still in the landing position and the speed at V ref, which is the landing speed, obviously. If we have an engine failure, then we need to achieve a gradient of at least 0.75% when 1,500 feet above the runway with the landing gear now retracted, the flaps now retracted, and a speed of 1.2 VS1. Basically, we need to climb away fast enough. 
So I'm going to summarize using the CAP698 document to show you how good a document this is to have in the exam if you're stuck. When I sat my ATPLs, I found performance quite a difficult subject to wrap my head around. And in the exam, this document really helps if you don't remember everything, you don't necessarily need to memorize all the factors and specifics, you just need to be familiar with this document and know how to look up the relative parts quickly. So in class B, we have the option of the single engine piston and the multi-engine piston, which I've got in the one document here. I've left the class A stuff in a separate printout. But if we have a quick look at the SEP stuff, single engine piston. So if I lift that up, you should be able to see them. So if you see the general requirements, it says the operator shall not operate the single engine airplane at night in instrument meteorological conditions, except when under special visual flight rules unless surfaces are available which permit safe force landing to be executed and above a cloud layer that extends below the relative minimum safe altitude. That's what we started off with. We said single engine aircraft can be used in IMC or at night. So it restricts their uh, applications in terms of commercial transport. So instead of looking at the single engine stuff, let's look at the multi-engine stuff. So at the multi-engine stuff, at the general requirements, we can see that it tells us it's propeller driven aircraft having nine or less passenger seats and a maximum takeoff weight 5,700 kilograms or less. Performance accountability for engine failure on a multi-engine air, air, aeroplane in this class need not be considered below a height of 300 feet. So it's a bit more detailed than I've given, which is why it's such a good document. It's got all the specifics should you need it. And now if we think of those takeoff regulations, we can see the requirements at the bottom of the page written out in plain English. So remember at the very start of the video when we're talking about the comparisons for a uh, takeoff distance requirement versus what is available, we can see that if there's no stop way or clear way, the available takeoff distance when multiplied by 1.25 must not exceed the takeoff run available. Then if we do have a stop way or a clear way, we must not exceed the TORA, when multiplied by 1.3, not exceed the ASDA, um, by 1.15, not exceed the TODA. That's all those regulation factors I was talking at the front of the class. Talking at the front of the class, talking at the start of the class. If we go over the page, the way to calculate all these distances is given as well. We can see that down at the bottom, there's a, oh, it says distance calculation. It gives you an example of all these things, all these um, stuff that you would get figures from the graph, say it's graphical distance. We apply any surface factor, slope factors, takeoff distance, uh, raw, then you calculate your regulatory factor and you find out your takeoff distances this way. So then we go to the climb regulations, for example. So in the climb regulations here, we can see our obstacle accountability area. We've got this semi width at the end of the takeoff distance available, uh, 60 meters plus half the wingspan. Then we add on 0 0.125 times D. It's all in here, it's all in here. And that initial climb that we have to assume, 4%, and then at 400 feet, measurably positive, and then at 1500 feet, 0 0.75. There's also a few nice little calculations in here. And this is talking about the uh, obstacle accountability area. If you turn, going out to 300, 600, or 900 meters, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, the graphs themselves, there's a lot of details in these, which I'm going to cover in the next class. Well, not that much details, but basically you get a value from the graph, you apply any factors, and that will work into the answer for the question. And basically what I'm trying to say is that if you're a bit stuck, get out the CAP 698, and it should hopefully help a bit, because there's lots of information in here should you feel stuck.